Hi, I really hope you enjoy this educational video. My name is Mark Bilek. I'm a certified financial planner, and my team and I focus on developing tax efficient or tax free retirement strategies for our clients. We also focus on investment strategies that allow folks to eliminate the worry and have the potential growth that you need in retirement. So enjoy the video, and at the end, I'll tell you how you can schedule a no cost, no obligation consultation with me. Enjoy. Good morning, everybody. It is 10 o'clock on uh, Tuesday, April 6th. Happy April. Beautiful spring day yesterday. Hopefully another beautiful spring day today. So I hope you're getting outside and enjoying those days. We've got a bit to cover today. I'm going to talk about um, uh, updates in the markets. Um, pretty quiet week. You'll see. I'm going to talk a little bit about market strategy. And if we have time, I'm going to talk about... Um, a, uh, an area of expertise that I have that I don't talk about too often, and it only comes into a play a few times a year when I'm pulled into a uh, situation, usually through an attorney for clients who are uh, powers of attorney, trustees, or executors. But sometimes they're existing clients, and in this case, this is what, what sparked this, is that I had a client say to me, hey, you know, I'm a trustee of my father's trust, and, and I need some help with this. And uh, this is an area I, I actively worked in quite a bit um, uh, for several years and, and uh, the retirement space for all you folks now doing this tax, uh, tax efficient or tax free planning has gotten so, um, uh, so much more that that hasn't been a focus as much of mine, but it's still vitally important. So uh, I'm going to talk about, um, uh, if we have time, I'm going to talk about fiduciary assistance for um, powers of trustees. Uh, powers of attorney, excuse me, trustees and executors. And uh, and I've actually, I'm going to tell you about some upcoming special uh, education webinars that we're going to be having in April, May, and June. And uh, and that's one of them. So uh, uh, hopefully I'll get an opportunity to talk about it today. I'm going to watch the time because we've got quite a bit to talk about with uh, as far as investment, um, investment really fundamentals. And, that, and that's another class I'm going to be doing um, coming up soon is Investment Fundamentals. So let me say again, good morning and welcome to the webinar. Just as a reminder, you are on mute. There is Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. You can type in questions as we go. Your chat is disabled and these, um, these uh, webinars are being recorded. Now we've made some progress in the recordings. I told you I'm good at a lot of things, I think, but getting these recordings edited and up on our website has been a little bit of a struggle, mostly because of the compliance factor of it. But I have a really sharp individual, my son, who is helping me edit these. And uh, uh, he's com he completed about five videos uh, yesterday. So um, if he continues at that clip, he'll be done in about... Uh, 20 business days because there's a lot of videos, but um, I think we're only going to pull out what we think are really the gems and then we'll just start including these webinars on a weekly basis. So you should be seeing these eventually on your uh, uh, on the uh, website, we're, but we're going to do the the special ones first because we have Ed Slot who was with us. We have uh, David McKnight a couple different times. We I think David's been been with us three times uh, in the past 12 months. Um, you know, we have uh, two different attorneys. We had a real estate uh, uh, mortgage individual, a, a um, uh, reverse mortgage uh, individual. That was a fascinating webinar. And we did that twice, if you remember. And then we had uh, Steve Bobrin, who's our Medicare expert. So we're going to get those out first. And of course, the advanced classes and the, the other uh, classes that we do. So um, so we're going to uh, work, keep working on those recordings and they're going to be uh, available on the website at some point. So uh, upcoming special webinars that are to be scheduled should be April, May, and June. A uh, little bit of flexibility there because I have to, we've got some things happening in, in May um, potentially that we've got to, uh, we have to work around. But first uh, you asked for it last week after we had the, uh, I was talking about funding of your retirement and doing Roth conversions using annuities and what it means, um, how these annuities can be beneficial, sometimes how they can be sticky and have some drawbacks. So uh, we started talking about that yesterday and we, we ran all the way up to the 11 o'clock hour, which is unusual. I like to usually stop at 1045. Sometimes it's 1030, but I don't like to go too too far beyond 1045. Um, 
but uh, you all asked for a special class using annuities and retirement planning and Roth conversions. So tentatively, that's going to be scheduled for 428, April 28th, tentatively. Uh, and then the following month uh, or the following in the series, hopefully in May, will be the fiduciary assistance for powers of attorneys, trustees, and executors. Now, again, this is a CLE I've done many times. A CLE is continuing legal education for attorneys. I've done it through our local bar association. And um, no offense to the attorneys out there, but you know, uh, I've, I've witnessed and I've heard that attorneys like to read books or read newspapers or do their work during their continuing legal education. They don't really pay attention. And I've had many people say that this is the one CLE I come and I pay attention to. Uh, and I, it always gets high marks. So um, I guess that's beneficial. And then the, uh, the next one will be investment fundamentals. So uh, I just added this this morning because as I was working through some of the investment discussions today, um, I thought it would be good to go back and look at the fundamentals that strategic asset allocation versus tactical allocation using ETFs compared to mutual funds compared to separately managed accounts. And we'll talk about all those differences and what they are and, and really the um, fundamentals of investing. And, and, and right now is a good, well, it's always a good time to look at it, but um, typically I revisit our portfolios every quarter. So we're coming up on um, the, uh, it was the end of the quarter in March. And I usually start getting the statements, the performance statements for the fund managers um, at the mid, mid time in April. So say April 15th. Uh, I, I dug in our portfolios early. I started about three weeks ago because uh, I've shared with you some of my concerns, rising interest rates, rising inflation, um, maybe uh, you know some dampened returns on the equity, the stock side. So, um, so it's, it's always a good time to just reevaluate and maybe make some changes in portfolios, but you don't want to be capricious about it. You don't want to make changes to make changes. So there are some key factors that sparks us to make changes. Um, and we'll talk about those and what you should be looking for in your um, investment portfolios. Now that's in the schedule, we're looking at April, May, June. So that's not gonna take us until, uh, that we're not gonna get there until June. So if you have any questions about your, your uh, portfolios themselves, certainly if you're a client of ours, let's talk about it if you have questions. If you're not a client yet and you wanna go over your uh, investment portfolio, give us a call or schedule time on my calendar. At the end of this webinar, my, as, as always, my calendar will populate on your screen or should, and you can choose a time. April's pretty good. We've got some generous times right now. Um, I'm seeing uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday this week. Well, um, something just happened to Thursday and Friday. I've got one time on uh, two o'clock on Thursday, two o'clock on Friday, but tomorrow's pretty good. Um, and then uh, we've got Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, some really good choices for the the, uh, the the week of the 13th, nothing the week of the 19th, and then the 27th, 28th, and 30th, we have some time. So that's that's unusual for the calendar this close. So uh, take advantage of it. Um, okay, so let's get into it. Uh, let me just look at my toolbar here. All right. So it has been a rocky 2021. You remember in the beginning, I leave this note here. I at first, probably the first webinar of the year, I said, you know, it was, a, we turned out to have a great 2020, but plan for a rocky 2021. And it has been. Now I'm going to share my screen with you and I'm going to share with you because it's going to lead into the discussion. One of the charts I'd like to look at, I'm just making it a little larger. So I'm sharing my notes, but just this screen. So Stand by for me. Okay, what you should see in front of you is something that reads Invesco markets markets review at a glance week ended April uh, uh, the second of April 2021. So obviously that was Friday. So raise your hand for me if you can see that. Thank you, Kathy. And and if I had last week's chart up here, it would look very similar. So let's just focus on a couple of different areas here. So um, over the one week return was only one quarter of one percent. Can everybody see that? Okay, just raise your hand if you can see it. Okay. All right, that's great. Um, I can make it a little, um, I'll make it a little larger and just move it around as we need to. All right, so you'll see that the one week return of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, that's one of, that's really the most uh, common index in the US um, for the stock market, that and the S&P 500. Uh, the one week return was 0.25. 
year to date, we're at 8.85. So clearly last week, this was 8.6. One year, so one year is April 2nd, 2020, uh, 2020 to 2021. Is fifty eight percent return really fabulous? Because we were in the in the really in the middle of it right now, or maybe maybe just coming out. I'd have to look, but really in the middle of the dip. And you'll see for the S and P five hundred, one point one six last week, seven point four two for the year, sixty one point seven seven percent for the um, uh, for the year over year. Now let me just back out some of these uh, things. Let me see if this will erase it. Well, because I want to I want you to see Nasdaq as well. NASDAQ is up 2.61% for the year or last week, 4.77% for the year and still 81% year over year. So that's really good. And you can see, you know, some of the other areas we have um, the, the rest of the globe, less the U S right. Taking the U S out of there, it's up a half a percent for the year, 5% year to date, 52% uh, year over year. We have the uh, EM is emerging market. So, that, that's not geographically the size of the, the country, but really it, how developed their markets are. And then we have um, uh, also another piece of international markets. So we have a half a point here, very similar to this return up here. And there's all different areas. So I wanna draw your attention to something we don't usually talk about. And that is um, these style boxes that you see here. So let me let me erase all this so it doesn't get confusing. Now this is a little advanced, but when we're developing a portfolio or portfolios, you know, we, we often see these uh, pie charts, right? I'm gonna draw a part pie chart over here. And you've got these different components. Now you'll see things like large company. We're gonna focus on two things today, large company value, large company growth. And uh, you might see that, you know, you've got 25% in large company growth and 25% in large company value. Now, I believe in strategic asset allocation. Strategic asset allocation says, given a certain amount of return, you get a certain amount of risk. And that holds true over a period of time. And I've talked to you before about these different periods of time, you know, 1926 to 2021 and these broad averages over those times. And they're very different for you. So we do have to invest uh, strategically and, and uh, hmm, two different ways, right? Strategic asset allocation, but we also have to be strategic to your needs and, and a little bit tactical to your needs. Um, and it's, I'm starting to confuse the terms here uh, for you, I think, because it's uh, uh, tactical allocation is when you, when you slant things and you'll, you'll say, for instance, and this is a recommendation, I'm just making an, giving you an example. I think gold is gonna outperform, so I'm gonna put more gold in my portfolio. Strategic asset allocation, as I said, says as long as you have um, the correct percentages in each one of these pie charts and the investments within the pieces of the pie chart perform well, then you'll get a certain amount of return for a certain amount of risk over time. But as you know, I go one step further, I do the account segmentation and that's where it gets very uh, strategic for you individual because we develop those accounts just set up for your times of your life. So I don't want to get into that too much because I can run kind of crazy on it. Let me choose a different color here. Uh, I kind of hate red on these screens, so I'm going to make it green. All right. Now, what we we're, we're going to talk about today is value and growth. And these, these style boxes are something that developed maybe in the late 1990s, early 2000s, where we as investment consultants said, when, when we're determining how to, pull, how, to, how to fund these portfolios, we don't want these managers to, to go outside of these areas. These, if it's a growth manager, we want it to be, uh, we want them only invest in growth. And we're going to talk about what growth versus value is. If it's a value manager, we only want them to invest in um, value. And then um, if the core is kind of a blend between the two or, or, uh, there's been a theory lately about taking those reins off. We've been we've been too focused on these style boxes with investment managers, but I think it's important to have some um, clarity in the portfolios here. We can have a, a manager that that we let we give free reign that kind of lives outside of this allocation um, portfolio. Uh, that as long as he or she or their group is adding value, that's fine. 
We don't want to hold them to a style box, but when we're building these portfolios, we want representation, uh, large size companies, mid sized companies, small size companies in these different areas. Now you'll see here, let's, let's, uh, let's clear this. You'll see here that so far this year, value has outperformed growth quite a bit. Well, that's really flip-flop because over the last decade, I think the numbers are growth has returned about 17% where value has returned about 10%. Now, 10% is solid, right? There's nothing wrong with an average solid return, but you might look back if you're just evaluating these funds in a vacuum and you look at the last 10 years, well, why would I invest in something that um, that is underperforming the other by 7% on average? Well, that's because these things are cyclical. So sometimes value out, outperforms growth and growth outperforms value. So my belief system is you should have representation in each area. Most of my clients aren't looking to uh, hit the, the ball out of the park every single time. They're looking at just solid returns year over year and managing that downside growth. And it's very important to have representation in each area. Now, think about it. If you just jettisoned value because, hey, that doesn't, that doesn't work for me. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't perform well. Look how much you've underperformed this year so far. So that's a 10 is that 10? That's that's a little under 10% uh, growth. And that's consistent across the board here. So there's some reasons for that. Uh, and we're going to talk about it. But I wanted to explain when I started talking about value and growth, why that's important and what that really means. So I'm just going to pause here and see if we have any questions. All right, I don't see any questions. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to read to you why what I just told you is uh, is important going forward as we potentially have this changing dynamic in the markets. So we had this incredible run in the bond markets. Now, what do we do with bonds? We typically have bonds in our portfolio to offset the risk of stock. What do we do with our bond holdings? Because we probably have significantly more risk in our bonds than we do our stocks right now because as, as interest rates go up, bond values tend to go down and some of them go down very sharply. So we have to be careful. And there's certain types of bonds that you can buy to offset this rising interest rate risk. And th these are part of the changes we're making in our portfolios. Now you might say, well, Mark, that sounds tactical. Well, in a way it is, but um, again, there are small tactical things you can do in a portfolio that doesn't, um, uh, I can, the only word I can think of is bastardize, that doesn't bastardize the whole, the integrity of the strategic allocation. So, um, so that, that's an example is the, the, the risk of the bond market with the rising interest rate and uh, interest rates and inflation. So um, let, me, let me talk more about that from the perspectives of BlackRock. This is really what, uh, these are conversations I've been having you know, with our team as we're building portfolios or reevaluating portfolios and with some clients who are calling and saying, hey, what do you think about this? What's going on? Um, how do we make changes uh, in the uh, in the markets? And, and it goes back to a conversation I've shared with you before where a client said to me, how do you, a new client, she, she wanted to know, well, how do you react to changes in the market? Market suddenly drops. How do you react to those changes? And I just want to remind you, the answer is you don't react to it. It's when you, when you react, it's typically when you fail. The, the, and that's only in the case if you build the portfolio uh, correctly, you give it a strong foundation to begin with, you know that you're going to have different drops in, in your portfolio at times. But we build it, remember, using asset allocation, right? Developing that pie chart I just showed you, and in, 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 uh, in our case, is more. But asset allocation, principal protection, and then account segmentation. So those three stool legs really help the stability of the portfolio. Now, I, I use the example of, you know, the buildings when I first left the Air Force and I, I worked in San Francisco, the buildings in San Francisco were, were built knowing that from time to time there's going to be earthquakes in San Francisco and there's, there's going to be damage to those buildings, but they built them on foundations that handle the rockiness. I think the Transamerica building is built kind of on a big ball bearing. So it can move a bit. There's going to be damage to the building, but it's not going to crumble down. And I like to think about that from a performance or a portfolio structure point of view. So let me first tell you in a, a, um, a definition. I'm going to read this definition to you of growth versus value. We just talked about that. And this is, this is going to be an important point of conversation today. 
So um, I like, as you know, I like to go to the things that you can uh, you can access yourself. And this is right from Investopedia. Investopedia is a great resource for anybody. I go, I'm in Investopedia often. I, you know, I don't, I don't know how often, but often. I'll just uh, I'll I'll have these things where I I know what that means somewhere in the back of my mind from you know my CFP training or wherever. I, I know what that is. I just can't clarify it for myself or have a good definition that I can send to somebody. So I'll go into Investopedia. They do a good job and anybody can, can go to Investopedia. And this is a good de definition. So I'm just going to read it to you. Growth stocks are those companies that are considered to have the potential to outperform the overall market over time because of their future potential. Makes sense. They have the ability to grow. Value stocks. Now, when, you, when, I, when I say growth stocks, and value stocks. I am also saying growth mutual funds and growth ETFs because don't forget the underlying um, issues in the mutual funds are certainly the, uh, the the stock positions or the bond positions themselves. The ETFs are the indices or the, the index that attracts. So growth stocks and value stocks. So growth stocks are those companies that are considered to have the potential to outperform the overall market over time because of their future future potential. Value stocks are classified as companies that are currently trading below what they are really worth and will thus provide a superior return. So as an example, Tesla is, you know, again, in the 700s as of yesterday. I'm not, this is not a recommendation to buy Tesla. I'm just, I'm just saying, um, I'm using it as an example because I happen to know that there's, there's an analyst out there and I think it's the Barron's um, from the, the, um, the owner of Barron's still has a two thousand or maybe three thousand dollar price target on on Tesla. So again, not a recommendation. It's a very volatile position, not a recommendation. But that's an example of now. Some people say that's certainly a growth stock. Well, some people may argue, well, that could be a value stock because because if someone's saying it's actually trading below its potential value, that could be argued that it's a growth stock or a, excuse me, a value stock. I would say it's a growth stock, right? But, um, but I'm just trying to give you an example. So which category is better? The comparative historical performance of these two subsectors yield some surprising results. So again, growth stocks are expected to outperform the overall market over time because of their future potential. Value stocks are thought to trade below what they are really worth and will thus theoretically provide a superior return. The question is whether a growth or value investing strategy is better uh, and it must be evaluated given your time horizon. I'll say that a combination of the two work, it seems to work really, really well. You have what you have to be careful about when people do their own investing, and uh, financial advisors get caught in this. They caught up on this as well. You know, I witnessed it with someone I worked closely with. They look back at just historical returns and they say, "I'm going to, you know, I'm going to choose this mutual fund just because it's outperformed over the last ten years." That means nothing about how it's going to perform over the next ten, the next ten years or next twenty years. So uh, you have to be disciplined to keep things in those um, uh, in those pie charts, because mathematically, this is what I've been shown is that that's what works best. And of course, we go two steps further with principal protection and account segmentation. But right now, we're just talking about asset allocation and putting those in. Um, Okay, I'm just seeing what else is germane to this conversation. Way too technical. All right, so now uh, this is another article in Forbes about growth versus value. And the author of Forbes reads or writes, we believe it's important to own both growth and value stocks in a portfolio. I think this article is from 2020. A blend of the two investment styles has offered the most compelling risk re reward over time as shown in the better together chart below. Uh, perhaps I'll share that with you. Balancing the historically higher volatility and value and lower return in growth. Um, our research al also reveals that growth and value are essentially anti-correlated. So anti-correlation means that they shouldn't move uh, along with each other. I'll tell you that that um, the value positions dropped much uh, uh, much more during the COVID drop and had a harder climb coming out of the uh, the COVID dip, right? The growth dropped a little less and came um, soaring back. Um, but um, uh, a perfectly non-correlated position will when if it's if if position A is up one percent, position B will be down one percent. That's perfect correlation. 
a non-correlation, excuse me. Uh, perfect correlation would be the same, right? Um, okay, so let's look at the better together. So this, this reads, since 1926, I love these long-term statistics, which mean nothing to you as an investor. Since 1926, value investing has returned 1,344,600,000% according to Bank of America. During that same time, growth investing returned just 626,600%. And then it reads case closed. So from 1926 to 2020, boy, you won out in value investing. But is that your timeline? Of course not. If, if you were invested in growth positions over the past 10 years, you did much better. The question is, what's going to happen for the next 10? And this is where the balance comes in. Um, Okay, it goes on to talk about the, the value and it, I did not include the chart, but I'm, I may share with you here. Um, I thought I had a good chart here from BlackRock, but let me tell you what BlackRock is saying. BlackRock is saying, while both growth and value extend benefits, portfolios may have room for greater value exposure. So they're, they're, they're overweighting. So BlackRock is a tactical investment firm. Um, they're overweighting towards value because they believe that with rising interest rates and rising um, inflation, uh, that the value stocks are going to have a um, better position for growth. So that is just the source of one analyst. Um, BlackRock has certainly had its, it has, it has its hits and its misses. For sure. Remember, they're the ones who overweighted the European Union uh, last year, thinking that the, the EU was going to uh, recover better than, than the US in the um, coronavirus, the pandemic. They completely missed the mark on that. But, uh, but they have a, a very good uh, track record. So, um, but they're really focused on, and again, this re reference back to 1927 is really not applicable to this conversation because while it's really great to know those statistics, it's it's really about what your timeline is and and how it's going to affect your timeline. And frankly, you won't know that until you look back and see. So um, so that's why it's important to plan these things in a good foundation. And I believe a good foundation has a representation of each one of those areas. And also having a good manager or a good ETF that allows. Uh, some openness, right? Uh, just some freedom to kind of move uh, outside of those style boxes I showed you, especially if it's a fund manager, because if the management team has talent and we're uh, and in choosing individual stocks and we're pigeonholing it, you know, literally to a style box, we're not allowing them to uh, to realize their full potential. So any any questions about that before I move on? I hope that wasn't too technical. I'm trying to give you an idea of, um, you know, these these investment fundamentals and why what these uh, analyst um, uh, statements really mean. So I hope that was helpful. All right. So I am going to have some time to uh, to go over the. I'm going to give you a very in the next 15 minutes or so. I'm just going to give you a very brief idea of what's coming up with this discussion about uh, fiduciary assistance for. Um, um, uh, powers of attorney, trustees, and executors. And uh, this also extends to retirement plan sponsors. I'm a retirement plan sponsor for our 401k. So if you have a small business, um, you have a fiduciary responsibility for that too. Now, when, when I'm talking about fiduciary, most people are thinking about us, right? Right, us as fiduciaries, planners, financial advisors. But what I'm talking about here is you. You, if you are a trustee, if you're an executor, or if you're a power of attorney, you have a fiduciary responsibility and that responsibility is enormous. And I could go on and on about this because again, it's something I'm passionate about. You know, one of the letters after my name is, is a credit investment fiduciary. And that goes back to 2010 or so when I, when I received the specialized training in, in fiduciary uh, management and fiduciary assistance. Um, because hardly anybody was talking about fiduciaries at the time, but it, it was so important because I saw it a lot. I, I got quite a, uh, an education when I worked at Wachovia and for a brief time, Wells Fargo after they took over, but I referred to it as triage, you know, with, with, uh, with all the people coming into Wachovia at the time, 
we had, uh, I covered, you know, anywhere from three to five bank branches and there were a few bankers in each one and they were always referring people to us with all kinds of problems. Simply they needed to invest money or, or they had like a, a significant uh, estate issue or, or something really cumbersome, like they were, they were the trustee of a trust and they didn't know how to handle it. So we were, we were always dealing with a wide range of different things. So it was great training in those five years I spent there. And, and I learned a lot and I, I did, I, I referred to it one time when I was speaking um, to uh, a group of advisors that it, it's really a triage situation. You're, you're bringing in, um, you know, you're looking at Joe Blow's issue and, and do I deal with this first or do I handle this investment question first? And it was a really, really great um, learning experience for me. And that's where I met my office manager, Jessica Fee, who's coming up on 14 years with me. Uh, it's amazing. And, uh, and so that was, that was of course great. But um, uh, I lost my point there. But but what what's important is that it, folks who are powers of attorney, trustees, executors, that you realize um, what your responsibilities are because people get in trouble. I'm just going to make a quick change here for you because I still have planned sponsors. Uh, where people get in trouble is not knowing the rules and not having a process to follow the rules. So I'm just going to give you a brief look at um, what the um, uh, what the rules are, who it affects, and where you can look for for more information. So I'm gonna uh, I've got a PowerPoint that I used in the past, and I'm just gonna share that. So let me uh, share my screen here again. And this is just the beginning of the. Uh, so you should see something now that says fiduciary requirements for powers of attorney, trustees. And executor. So raise your hand, please, if you see that. Okay. So now again, this is this is the um, continuing legal education course that I've done for a bar association. So for attorneys, I'm just going to go through the first few slides of this, and then um, in one of my upcoming special webinars, we're going to talk more and much more in depth about this process and really how to manage the process. But today is about awareness because if you find yourself in this position. You're a trustee, you're a power of attorney, you're an executor. You, I want you to realize your fiduciary responsibility and realize the steps that you should be taking to make sure that you're, um, you're not getting yourself in trouble potentially. Because often there are other people involved. If you're the sole beneficiary of your trustee, if you're the sole beneficiary of the, of the, um, the, uh, of the will, or if you're an executor or the estate, then you probably have things easier. But not always. So um, I have a client who was in that situation. He was a sole beneficiary of a trustee. He was a sole beneficiary of his father's estate. And then he learned that there was a second will and that will named um, a university as um, the remainder beneficiary after the son passed away. Well, now that, at, that university has a, an interest in that estate and it's not small, it's a few million dollars. So, um, that university is really probably going to be paying attention to what this individual does. And if this individual doesn't follow the rules and doesn't follow the laws, he can get himself in some trouble. So what does trouble mean? Well, trouble could mean lawsuits. Uh, trouble could also mean a criminal case, uh, believe it or not. Here in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, there were two sisters. If you've attended my class, you've heard this discussion. There were two sisters who were powers of attorney for their mother who was in a nursing home. And the mother said to them, uh, this is your money. I want you to spend it, get your nails done, go on a cruise, buy, you know, buy what you want. And they did exactly that at mom's wishes. Well, the nursing home wasn't very happy about that. And the nursing home uh, filed a complaint with the, um, I think it was the state attorney. No, it would be the district attorney's office, or maybe they filed it with the, uh, the state and they, the state referred it to the district attorney's office. I think that's what happened, but they got arrested. They got charged. They got fingerprinted and photographed. Right. And, um, uh, and it was a it was a really sad case. And one of the ladies involved, her husband was in law enforcement, he was a police officer. So it it, it really um, was a challenging situation. She thought she was just doing her, what her mother said, but she violated they violated a litany of rules that had to do with her fiduciary responsibility as, as power of attorney and uh, really got themselves jammed up. And that's the extreme, of course, lawsuits and and criminal cases. And I think the criminal cases are probably very few and far between, but it happened right here in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. 
but we also have family matters, right? So if we were standing in front of a class, uh, a live class, and I said, has anyone ever been an executor of an estate? And hands would go up. And, I, and then I would say, has anyone ever seen a family disintegrate through the estate process? And you hear groans, oh yeah, yeah, my, and then, and then you start hearing people giving their examples, you know, my sister, my, my, my friend, it, it happens all the time. So when you have things, we're gonna talk about a little bit about documentation. When you have things that are documented, when you have a process for what you're doing, it helps with that. I'm not gonna say it guards against it hundred percent. Communication is very, very important. And I always suggest pulling everybody in to whatever degree you can into these conversations very early. And very early means before really there's a need for that. So mom and dad make you the power of attorney, trustee, executor, and you have a big family like mine, right? I'm the youngest of 13. Uh, I would want to bring in all my siblings and, and have my mother, if she was still alive, have this discussion about what her instructions are for me, because that helps ease my burden a little bit. Uh, because that's the worst thing that happens. You know, families just, just disintegrate over money all the time. And it's a shame. So let's get into this a bit. So here we go. I promise I'm going to move the screen. Hold on. All right. What's the definition of an investment fiduciary? Mark, are you, you know, really, what are you talking about? I, does this really fit me? An investment fiduciary is someone who is managing the assets of another person and stands in a special relationship of trust, confidence, and or legal responsibility. Very simple. There are types of investment fiduciaries, and they can be divided into three groups, an investment steward, an investment advisor, and an investment manager. So the investment advisor and investment manager, right? That's really um, folks who do what I do. I'm going to talk about an investment steward. So the folks that are power of attorney, trustees, executors, they fall into the investment steward category. An investment steward is a person who has a legal responsibility for managing investment decisions, including plan sponsors, trustees, and investment committee members. And that trustees expands to um, executors. Typically, an investment steward is not an investment professional, not that expectation, but is responsible for selecting and overseeing investment professionals to act as investment advisors or investment managers for the plan, foundation, endowment, or other entity served by the investment steward. So you have to ask yourself, am I a fiduciary? if you're serving these capacities. And most of the times the answer is yes. Um, so the definitions and statutes and supporting law, we have ERISA, which is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act that drives 401k plans. We have the IAA, the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. We have the Uniform Prudent, Prudent Investors Act, um, the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act and Uniform Management of a Public Employees Retirement System, Systems Act. So what's really gonna affect um, what for, for most individuals, right? Not ERISA, because that's for 401ks, unless you're a plan sponsor, unless you have a business and you, you, um, uh, you, oversee, or you offer a 401k like we do, all right? I'm a fiduciary under ERISA. Uh, the Uniform Prudent Investors Act is really what governs uh, the individuals that are not investment advisors, powers of attorney, trustees, and uh, executors specifically. So there are these, you know, this company, uh, FI360 has developed these global uh, precepts uh, for fiduciary excellence, they call it. And um, it really gives you a guide and a process to follow if you're one of these folks. And I recently sent the handbooks to, um, to a client who is who found himself in this position, and I can't remember exactly who it is, so I, I apologize if you're on the, uh, the webinar. It might have been the fellow with the, with the college. Um, I think it was. But I had, I had two that just sprung up, and that's what, that's what um, uh, triggered this, because it wasn't from a lawyer, which is usually how it comes in. It was two existing clients that said, you know, I have this situation. So that's why I wanted to bring it to your attention, just in case you were one of those, you know, I am actually named as power of attorney, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes you don't even know. Sometimes people name me as power of attorney, mom and dad name me as power of attorney, and you're not aware of it. And that's a problem too. But um, so if an investment steward were to read all the laws defining fiduciary obligations, the steward would discover seven common requirements. We've adopted uh, these seven requirements as global fiduciary uh, precepts. So the first is know the standards, laws, and trust provisions you can't say, I don't know, 
And that's unfortunately what happens. I didn't know I couldn't do that. Or I, I, because you can't take money for your own benefit, you know, uh, prohibited transactions, things like that. But so of course, just like driving, right? You gotta know the standard laws and trust provisions. Um, many people don't know the provisions of the trust. Many powers of, or um, uh, well, even powers of attorney, many powers of attorney haven't even read the document or don't understand the document and don't understand the limitations. Sometimes I see power of attorney documents that I had one that said you can only invest in U.S. treasuries. Well, that really limits your limits your options. And if you if you then have gone in and purchased things under power of attorney uh, that are outside of that, you've created an issue for yourself, uh, especially if those things lose money. And, and you know what, by the way, it it doesn't matter if they lose money or not because people can complain either way. Uh, I had, I, when I was at Wells Fargo or Wachovia, I had a, um, a trust I was working with and, and the trust was at Bank of New York Mellon. They only held cash and uh, they were charging them 1% to hold cash. And they actually had a disclaimer on the statement that said they were not acting as fiduciary. I don't even know if that would hold, but um, uh, there was a complaint by, it, was, it came to me because there was a complaint by one of the beneficiaries of the trust that said, it's been sitting in cash for the last 10 years. If you would have bought Apple, it's talking to the trustee, not to me. Uh, if, if the trustee would have bought Apple, then it would have been worth 10 times that amount. So uh, there are the kind of complaints you get. Now, if the, the trustee would have bought Apple and it would have dropped, they would have complained about that too. So we're going to talk if, yeah, we're, we have five more minutes. We're going to talk about just how you can manage those, those issues. Nothing's perfect, but it's going to help you. Um, so know your standards, laws, and trust provisions. Diversify assets to the specific return risk profile for the beneficiaries of the trust or the powers of attorney, the, the, um, the folks you're an agent for, mom and dad, aunt and uncle, whoever that might be. Prepare an investment policy statement. Almost never done, almost never done. Investment policy statement simply says what can be done, what can't be done, um, what, um, uh, what's going to be invested in, et cetera. So hardly ever do I see that with uh, trusts and, uh, and executors. Use prudent experts, for example, an investment manager and document due diligence. So if someone hires me, for example, to, um, to help them manage the assets and help them through their fiduciary process, I will tell them every three years we should review, you should do a review of me and document that to make sure that you're, um, you're doing your due diligence. I'll do the due diligence on the investment managers for you and document that, but you should also do the due diligence on me to make sure that you're, you're getting everything that you pay for. Just like on the school board where I sit, you know, we've had the same attorney for the past 35 years. They do an excellent job, and, but they should be reviewed every five, right? We should send out a request for proposal and we should get um, feedback back from other law firms to see how uh, to see, make sure that we're getting the best deal for the public. You should do the same for your charges as a fiduciary under the, a trust, power of attorney, or executor um, situation. Control and account for investment expenses. Boy, has that changed. So when I first got into this business in 2001, it's been 20 years now, the average cost of investment management was about 2.5%, 2.2 to 2.5%. Boy, has that changed. So that's what financial advisors charged. Right now, the average is one, or you know, I still see more than one, but the average is probably one, and then it goes lower if, if depending on how money the amount of money you have. Uh, but it's also not only the the advisor's uh, choice, but or, or um, fee, but the fees of the investment managers as well, the funds, the ETFs, whatever you're using. Just like Bank of New York Mellon when they were holding cash at one percent, is that reasonable? Well, you know, you've got to back that up somehow. Monitor the activities of the, the prudent experts. That's what I was just talking about. What you, you know, you've got to, you can't just say, I don't look at the statements. As a private investor for your money, you can say that. As a fiduciary, you're not allowed to say that. You've got to review their statements. You've got to have a process for reviewing these things on a, on a uh, periodic basis. And how often should it be? At least, at least annually. At least annually, you should be going over the accounts, the objectives, where mom and dad are, where the estate is, where, you know, whatever the situation is. Avoid prohibited transactions. We talked about that. We have just a few minutes left. And, and avoid or manage other conflicts of interest in favor of the portfolio. I have to manage conflicts of interest all the time. You as a fiduciary have to do the same. So if you suddenly say, geez, I have $2 million in this, in mom's account. And I, if I borrow that, if I borrow a million dollars and invest in a house down in Ocean City, 
then that'll benefit. Yeah, that'll, that'll benefit everybody because uh, you know uh, my brothers and sisters can use it. Yeah, and, and then we can take it and we can maybe we can flip it or you know, well that could potentially be a prohibited transaction, and it could potentially be a conflict of interest um, because if it benefits you greater or everybody isn't involved, it could be a real problem for you. So that's just an example. So here's uh, here's this periodic table. This is part of the the manual. Uh, let me get over here. Uh, where's my laser point? This is part of the manual. That is the um, the uh, the investment story. The, the, I'm just forgetting the name of the book now. But the um, fiduciary excellence for investment stewards. And this shows all the different uh, the, all the different steps. So you see, there's there's four basic ones. The first one is organize. You want to have, you know, people come to me, mom and dad have stuff all over. Well, you have to organize those things. You got to have a copy of the will. You got to have a copy of the trust, copy of the power of attorney document. You got to have copies of all the statements. I don't see it much anymore, but I used to see people will come in with just like a box full of stock certificates and some of them were no good and some of them were significantly valued. So you've got to organize all those things and, and, and determining what, how the investments should be managed for the different, um, the different entities, trusts, estates. It could be different for mom and dad. All those things could have different objectives, all three things. And, and you could be pulled in a lot of different ways. Formalize, formalize your plan. Make sure you've got a plan, again, for even different entities. And yes, this gets very complex. Implement that plan. And then, of course, monitor that plan. So that they're the four basics, and then you've got different segments within it. All right, so I'm coming. Ne my next section is a case study. I'm not going to get on that. It's 1045 right now. I just wanted to give you an idea of really what you should be focusing on if you're a fiduciary, if you are a power of attorney, trustee, or executor. There is a lot to it. This is something we can help you with, um, and it's it's important. And I find that people don't get in trouble for making bad decisions. People get in trouble for making decisions without having a process. This formalize is extremely important. Formalizing is simply saying, I'm going to do this and this is how I'm going to do it. And if I decide to make changes for whatever reason, I want to take mom and dad out of a, uh, you know, 100% stock portfolio and I want to move them into a 100% cash portfolio because I want to move, I want to have those funds available for maybe they're in long-term care or whatever the situation may be. Uh, there, there should be a written process for it. Formalizing is writing down the process. You should take notes. You should record those notes. These are all the things that we do to help folks with the uh, fiduciary assistance. Okay. It is now 1047. I don't see any questions. I'm going to stop my share. So I'm going to remind you of our upcoming classes. I hope that was helpful. Give me some feedback. I know that there were two complex issues, uh, growth uh, investments, value investments, and then this crazy complex issue of fiduciary assistance. Give me some feedback on that. Just send me an email. Let me know. Um, we have some exciting things coming up. I'm still working on those real, that real estate webinar, but we have the three webinars, funding using annuities and retirement planning and Roth conversions. That's tentatively scheduled for April 28th. Fiduciary assistance for powers of attorney, trustees and executors and investment fundamentals. So that should, they should be our next uh, three special webinars. We have some new people on the webinar today. I want to welcome to welcome you to the group. I know you're going to enjoy these. You're going to have an opportunity to schedule time with me when, uh, when you log off my calendar should populate. If for some reason you can't find time to schedule time with me on that calendar, just reach out to us, send me an email. You can reach us at admin at outerboroughwealth.com. The nice thing about that admin and Outborough Wealth, it goes to me, it goes to Jessica, it goes to Hamiko, it goes to Emily. So any of us can handle the, um, the scheduling for you. That's it, folks. Have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your week and we'll see you next week. Take care. Hello again. I hope you enjoyed the video and perhaps you learned something new that can help you. If you want to schedule time for me for a no cost, no obligation consultation, you can use the link in the description and schedule a time that works best for you. If my schedule is full and you can't find anything, don't worry. Send us an email and we'll find a time that works for you. I look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you. Have a great day.